Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Go Fashion India Q4 FY22 Earnings Conference Call hosted by Dam Capital Advisors Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Rajiv Bharti from Dam Capital Advisors. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Anira. Good morning, everyone. Uh, representing Dam Capital, it's our absolute pleasure to host Go Fashion India Limited for its Q4 and full year 2022 ending conference call. The company is represented by Mr. Gautam Sarogi, uh, Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. R. Mohan, Chief Financial Officer. Over to Gautam for your uh, opening remarks and post which we'll open it for Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Rabi. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to everyone present on the call. I hope you all are keeping safe and healthy during these times. Uh, I would like to mark a thank you to the entire investor community for the tremendous support during the ICO in November 21. It was a proud moment for all of us. Along with me, I have Mr. R. Mohan, our Chief Financial Officer, and SGA, our Investor Relations Advisor. Hope all, you, you, uh, all of you have received our investor deck by now. For those who have haven't, you can view them on the stock exchange and the company website. FI22 has been a challenging year for this industry, and despite COVID-related lockdowns, our company has shown great resilience, and we have come out stronger than ever before. We are among the few apparel companies in India to have identified and, uh, and identified the market opportunity in women's bottom wear and have acted as a category creator for women's bottom wear. We have strengthened our portfolio by adding new products across all bottom wear categories. We have leveraged the advantage to create a direct-to-consumer brand with a diversified and differentiated product portfolio of premium quality products at competitive prices. During fiscal year 22, our volume grew by 34%, and despite the lockdown phase in January, our volumes for the quarter grew by 11% on a YOY basis. We have a strong unit economy with an efficient, uh, efficient operating model. We have a standardized and scalable developed model for our EBO base, and we have the know-how and experience for the same. Our unit economics has allowed us to expand our EBO network across various regions in India, including new EBOs in Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, and Tier 4 cities and towns. During fiscal year 22, the company has added 54 EBO stores, and we have crossed the 500 store milestone during the last quarter. Keeping in line with the growth strategy to open more doors closer to the consumer, the company is pushing ahead with expansion. We continue to invest expanding our store footprint across geography by adding 120 to 130 new stores every year. We are looking at omnichannel engagement for a seamless consumer experience, building on a technology-driven growth strategy to reach customers across all cities. Our products being core and essential to consumers have enabled us to operate on a business model where we offer limited discounts and sale of our products is typically at full price in our experience results in greater profitability. 97% of our EBO sales of, uh, for fiscal year 22 are all on full sale. In addition, our EBO's average selling price has increased primarily on the account of value-added products that we have introduced as part of our portfolio. Our ASP for fiscal year 22 is rupees 661 per unit. We have strategically undertaken brand building initiatives to gain visibility with prudent use of resources while incurring limited branding and marketing expenses. We detail our product under a single brand for improved brand recall and better marketing of our product, which has yielded one of the highest revenues per unit spent in the sector. We are leveraging technology to bring cost efficiency and enhance consumer experience. We intend to further improve our operating efficiency and ensure efficient supply chain management through global best practices. Among the measures that we intend to undertake include investing further in the infrastructure to improve productivity and time savings. We will look to upgrade our warehouse to optimize our inventory and supply management. We intend to implement new technologies to further expand and improve customer deliveries and enhance customer buying experiences with faster dispatches. We also undertake data analytics and that will allow us to better understand customer preferences, improve sales, and help scale our operations. We are also in the process to add 
and identify another small warehousing facility in Bhimandi in Maharashtra. We continue to focus on further strengthening our online sales to benefit from evolving customer trends in the market. We propose to make investments in digital channels to improve our omni-channel engagement experience for our customers and have a dedicated uh, team for the e-commerce operation. We also intend to leverage our existing capabilities to, uh, to increase our online presence by improving and upgrading our website. Our focus will be to target customer acquisition to drive sales through our website and online marketplaces. In addition, we intend to invest in content generation to build engagement with the younger audience. We look forward to continue to innovate and with a creative approach and launch more products while providing uh, more brand destinations for our consumers, which will help us grow and gain market share in the coming years. With this, I would like to hand over the call to our CFO, Mr. R. Mohan, for the update on the Q4 and FI22 FI financial. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam, and good morning, everyone. The company has posted a strong performance for the quarter ended 31st March 22, backed by an increased demand across product categories. Our revenues for the quarter stood at uh, 116 crores, as against the 90 crores in Q4 FI21, registering a growth of 29% year on year, led by the volume growth of 11%. Gross profit increased by 30% to 72 crores, the GP margins of 61.8 for the quarter. Our EBITDA for the quarter stood at 38 crores, registering a growth of 53% YNY as compared to 25 crores in Q4 FI21. Our EBITDA margins which stood at 32.4% have seen an improvement of 490 basis point on a year-on-year -year basis. Profit before tax for the quarter stood at 15 crores at 61% YOI from Q4 FI21. Profit after tax for the quarter stood at 12 crores, a yeah, 73% YOI growth over the FI21 Q4. Coming to the same uh, same source sales growth, we have seen a 17% SSG if compared to Q4 FI21, that is last year, and an SSG of 31% for the second half of this year. Coming to the financials, FI22, our revenue stood at 401 crore as against 251 crores in FI21. Registering a growth of 60% YN1. Our EBITDA for the year stood at 119 crores as compared to 46 crores in FI21. Our EBITDA margins which stood at 29.7 percent Profit before tax for FI22 stood at 48 crores, whereas profit after tax for FI22 stood at 36 crores. SLC for FI22 is not comparable due to COVID-related lockdowns. With this, we now open the floor for question and answers. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and 1 to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Ankit Keria from Philip Capital India Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. So I have three questions. So first is on your, what would be the volume growth in the SSG of 17% for the quarter, which we have posted, given that the ASP increase itself, YOI is around 13%. So, Ankit, the volume sure. growth uh, would be about 5%. Sure. And uh, you have also taken a price increase in the month of December and January of 50 rupees on the leggings. But if I look at your quarter-on-quarter right. quarter ASP increase, it's virtually flat. So, have we seen downgrading from the consumer side or, uh, you know, it's more of a mix change no, no, wherein the quarter three is high festive demand and winter wear. And we will see the benefits of the price increase in quarter one. So, Ankit, uh, the way it works is, see, whenever we increase the prices, the prices get increased for the newer pieces which comes out uh, from our production, from the outsourced production. So, till those new pieces get into the system and we start selling on the new price, it takes time for the transition to happen. So, basically, the inventory which is placed at the store level and the other channel level, we are not changing the price for the existing inventory. So, the price increase of 50 rupees, what you're talking about, 
it will show over a period of two three quarters it will not show immediately in quarter one or quarter four sure sir so in that case you know our inventory has seen a significant bump up uh, for the year you know while you have yeah. always guided 90 to 100 days of inventory uh, it's more than 150 day inventory today so what is the reason for the you know inventory bump up in the system yeah so so i'll explain the logic i'll take a few minutes to explain this because this is a very important point so see ankit uh, there is right now a very big uh, supply chain issue which is happening because you know raw materials prices have been fluctuating uh, the cotton has become a little scarce in availability so there is a lot of supply chain difficulties what the apparel industry is facing as far as cotton and fabrics are concerned now so we had built up inventory we keeping in our growth in mind what we want to do over the next few quarters and few years and in immediate future we have we have up the inventory so that we don't get affected by the external factor now today we are having about 165 crores of inventory these are we had 80 crores of inventory in march 21 so our inventory is almost doubled but if i take uh, inventory days as a calculation of what is my current running sale num number. See, currently, we are doing an average of 47 to 50 crores of monthly average sale. So, if I take my current monthly average sale number and then I compare the inventory what I'm holding, I'm having having I'm holding about 3.2 months of inventory, which is about 95 to 97 days, which is very much under control and in line with what our inventory planning is to begin with. So two things here. One is obviously we have bumped up inventory, keeping in mind the, the supply issue which is happening in the market. Second, most importantly, even if I take my current inventory number coinciding with what sale number I'm currently doing, which is about 47 to 50 crores on a monthly average, I'm having about 3.2 months of inventory, which is pretty much under control. Uh, so can you give us a breakup of finished goods inventory and uh, raw material inventory? Yeah, sure. So finished goods inventory, uh, so raw material inventory in that uh, in that 165 crores would be about 45 crores, if I'm not wrong, around that number. Okay. Uh, so two more questions from my side. One is on your online okay. sales. Uh, you know, in FY22, we only saw 3% growth while the company growth was 60%. Uh, you know, while you have invested a lot and, you know, uh, about online being the key pillar for growth, uh, why is only 3% growth in the online for the system? See, currently what, so, uh, so I'm going to see online, it's a very, very important channel, but it, like I had mentioned last time also, it will grow at, it will, it will grow at a, uh, at a slower speed compared to offline. See, currently what we are doing is, we, we are building our new website a few months ago, which has now the new website has already gone live. We, now, since the new website is live now, we are building the omni-channel strategy. So this push from 3% to probably say double digit in the coming quarters, we start, the work in progress is starting to happen now. Since our new site is up now, up and running now, we are building the omni-channel where we are integrating the new site with our front-end retail. So keeping these things in mind, the sales will start, the online sales will start picking up in the coming quarter. Sorry to interrupt you, Ankit. I'll request you to come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. A request to all the participants, please restrict to two questions per participant. If time permits, please come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. The next question is from the line of Devanshu Bansal from NC Global Financial Service. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just in continuation of your question on inventory, uh, just wanted to check. Uh, uh, I understood that uh, the current revenue base is also low, uh, and uh, uh, given the higher monthly run rate, uh, uh, the inventory levels are higher. But uh, uh, at FY23 end, uh, should we uh, uh, inventory levels be at 90-95 days? Uh, is, is this a, a, a correct understanding? See, I mean, we are wanting, we are going to be looking at maintaining similar levels of 90 to 95 days a uh, month. Sure. And um, uh, in terms of uh, channels, you have indicated that uh, uh, if you have to contribute about 80% uh, mix, uh, so just wanted to check as in uh, what is the timeline uh, to achieve this uh, uh, sort of mix? Sorry, come again. Sorry, Dimansh, I missed your question. Please come again. So in the presentation, you have indicated you expect EBO channel uh, uh, to contribute about 80% to your overall revenues. Uh, so I just wanted to check the timeline for that. Uh, so the one is very hard to uh, to specify exact timeline, but we are hopeful that maybe in over the next one one and a half years or two years we should get to that number. 
Okay, and uh, for the rest, twenty percent. Um, uh, so, if we see uh, online channel, uh, you have indicated that uh, you have uh, uh, sort of good plans there. So, majority of that share shift will happen from LSS. Uh, is this a correct understanding? See, I'll tell you what is our eventual plan. Eventually, in two, uh, two three years down the line, what we are planning to see is that EBO and online together. Should calculate, which is a direct to consumer. If you are online together, should contribute to 90% of the thing. Where LFS should share comes down below 10%, and uh, our MBO and other channels would be less than 3%. So this is our eventual mix. What we are planning to achieve in the next two to three years, where 90% of our sales is coming from MBO and online together. Sure, got it. Uh, sir, uh, just in uh, as a follow-ups, but LFS in this quarter has particularly seen about uh, 150 sort of store editions. So, from that perspective, uh, uh, store editions have been uh, sort of particularly strong. And uh, uh, so, interestingly, even tier two, three, four towns actually added about 100 stores of those 150 stores. So, just wanted to check. Uh, uh, so, what are the plans in terms of store edition for LFS format? Uh, so, Dwanshu, what we are doing in LFS is we are, uh, we, are, we are very selectively growing with our partners. It's not that we are uh, going everywhere and adding stores across uh, the country. It's not like that. Selectively, where our target market, markets and strategy are, we are selectively adding those stores with LFS partners because LFS is a very, very important channel. It gives us access to newer towns, newer geographies. Before we can think about opening our reviews also, it gives us a taste and flavor of, the, of that new city. So we are going to continue to expand, and uh, this last one year we've been able to add a good number of LFS stores, and I'm hopeful that even in fiscal year 23 we'll be able to add a good number of stores. Okay. Lastly, wanted to check what are the kind of investment in terms of optics as well as capex uh, for the online uh, uh, investments that you have indicated for the coming year. So, yeah. So the one to see, or uh, as far as online and omni is concerned, it's not a very cost heavy or very investment heavy channel frankly see our new site what we wanted to do live we have already got it live our new site is ready our front end uh, uh, EO software and our back end sap software also is ready integrating the three for an omni channel experience is not going to be very capital heavy it's going to the, so the investments in digital are not going to be very material in nature Sure. Uh, so I wanted to check from team uh, perspective, as in you indicated investment in team, warehousing, etc. So anything uh, uh, to watch out there? See, on the e-com front, we have hired a dedicated e-com team who understands e-com in and out. See, we are more of an offline business, right? We are more of a brick and motor business. So now we have one dedicated team for e-com and online who just, who their entire focus is only online and they are not focused on offline at all. So they, for them, this team, what we have formed over the last few months, we are, see, we are starting to see good results. So we are hopeful that this will add and help us grow our online. Thank you, Devansh. I'll request to come back in the question queue. Participants are requested to ask to two questions per participant. The next question is from line of Vaishnavi. So Manan Vati, please go. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for taking the question. Uh, so two things. So one on the inventory build up, right? So do we expect sales growth to probably accelerate at a faster rate versus what we have seen in the last one year if we have so much of uh, inventory build up? Uh, so we uh, very hard to link the two. I think sales are largely driven by uh, market sentiments and how consumer behavior is happening. Our idea of building inventory was more from the perspective of there should not be any stoppage in supply chain or break in supply chain. Uh, but uh, it will be hard to say that because of higher inventory, we would be able to sell a lot better would be a very, would be a hard assumption. But we are uh, quite, uh, now since consumer sentiments are anyways back after the third day, we are very hopeful that the sales uh, over the next uh, couple of quarters will be very strong. Okay, and my second question is um, on the pledge that was uh, done in the last quarter, right? Uh, any specific yeah. reason for the same? So, so basically, the uh, our pledge was for personal reasons. Uh, our requirement uh, uh, as a family, as a promoter family, was 150 crores, and we had taken that for uh, this pledge was specifically taken for personal requirements and commitments. And this is short-term in nature. We understand the sensitivity around this uh, subject. 
and this is short term in nature and we are looking to close the pledge uh, within 3 to 6 months okay 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 thank you thank you vishnu thank you the next question is from line of akhil from centrum broking please go ahead hi uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, my first question is on the store closure uh, so what is the policy or the time frame we apply given that we uh, um, we see significant store closures which have happened over last four years almost every time stores have closed uh, so what kind of uh, policies we can look at this in the store yeah yeah so so see uh, In, as far as store closures are concerned, see, if you take most of the store closures, what have happened in the last two years is largely uh, related to COVID. Because post COVID, first wave and second wave, there were many markets which didn't revive. There were many malls which didn't revive. So we had no choice but to exit. So this a large number of those uh, closures are pertaining to COVID. In general case scenario, our closures have been limited. and uh, we usually at least wait for a year or year and a half to assess the performance of the store and then decide whether we want to close up sure and my second question is on the expansion in tier 2 and tier 3 towns uh, we have significantly added in uh, tier 2 tier 3 and tier 4 towns so what kind of rent to revenue ratio we look at and how does the store dynamic differ uh, in this city versus a metro and tier 1 yeah, yeah sure So, the, uh, if I compare tier one versus tier two and tier three, uh, the real disparity between tier one versus tier two, tier three, tier four will be slight in revenue. See, the kind of revenue what we generate for an average store in a tier one versus a tier two, there will be small delta difference. Obviously, a tier two, tier three, tier four will be slightly lower than a tier one for this average store. Having said that, the other economics of the business, as far as rent to revenue ratio is concerned. Salary to revenue ratio is concerned, or even as a percentage of revenue is concerned, that is pretty much same because in tier two, tier three, tier four, uh, the costs are that much lower. So for us, uh, the rent to revenue and the EBITDA percentage does not change. It's only the numerator, the revenue changes slightly between a tier one and a tier two. Having said that, the kind of rent to revenue ratio is what we look at while finalizing a store in a tier three city or a tier one city. We look at about fifteen percent of rent to revenue ratio. Then we find. Okay, and just one follow-up on this. So our brand equity in tier two and tier three, I'm assuming, will be a bit lower as compared to tier one and metro city. Would that interpretation be correct? Uh, well, uh, I would say our brand recall would be slightly lower in tier two, tier three, tier four because right now our presence, if you see in terms of video network, we are largely the top eight. So yes, it would be. Uh, it would be. Uh, 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 That uh, a brand recall would be lower in tier two, tier three, as of now because our presence is low. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gautami Desai from Chanakya Capital Services. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sir, I just wanted to know your experience on value-added items. Uh, experience in the sense that what would what would be your competitive advantages? And also, when uh, also I would tend to believe that in those items um, there are established brands, and hence your experience will be very different uh, to your legends, which is your mainstay. Uh, so that's my first question. And another question is, are you able to pass on the cotton prices, the hike in cotton prices, completely, or have you done any change in the fabric mix? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ashwini. So. Uh... So first on the value-added products, see, look for us. One of our key strengths is product innovation, right? So there have been many products which we have innovated and de- developed in house, and then we have bought in the market. Like for example, a very important value-added product we had launched three four years back was the kurti pant. The kurti pant was a product innovative, uh, innovated and developed in house. So our strength is our product innovation, and definitely our value-added products have given us the edge over our competitors. And one of the reasons for our consumer to keep coming back to our Bokalas store is not only for the variety in colors what we have in our leggings and chudidars, but for the kind of range of other products we have across jeggings, pants, uh, harems, patiyalas, and palazzo. So our value-added product strength is one of our key strengths uh, in terms of in terms of our consumer base. Now, 
coming to uh, the cotton price increase uh, see we have not changed the composition of the fabric we believe that uh, one of our key selling points are in the quality of our fabric so we have not touched the fabric quality at any point uh, we have uh, whatever our long term price increase what we have seen in raw material that much increase we have taken at the at the selling price see when there are short term fluctuations in price we don't really increase our selling price we absorb it because our gross margin gives us the room to absorb it but whenever there is there are long term fluctuations in price we correspondingly increase the selling price so we increase the price without touching the quality of the fabric so whatever the price has happened price high that much you feel that with this 50 rupees it will get covered sorry can you come again i lost in the thing whatever price high that has happened in your fabric cost uh the 50 rupees price increase which you have taken uh, so yeah. will that cover that cost See, we are taking two price increases about me one we have taken in uh, april uh, 2021 and one we have taken another increase in december 2021 so these two increases what we have taken over the last uh, year and a half will cover that increase in price in raw material without any problem Okay, and sir, your you say that your uh, you know LFS is going to come down to ten percent. I mean that's what you wish for. So then, in that case, would your inventory go down below ninety to ninety five days? Because then I don't see that you know you any reason for your inventory to stay so high. No, see inventory got me. We are maintaining ninety to ninety five days consciously. See, we want to maintain inventory in the ninety ninety five days because we are in a high growth business and. In some sort, our inventory does not have any risk because there is no fashion element. So, at a company level, in the short term future, we want to maintain 90 to 95 days of inventory for faster growth. Okay. Otherwise, what changes in your working capital you foresee if you can bring down your LFS to less than 10 percent? Sure. So, what we want to happen is our receivables, which are at about 50 days, would start coming down to about 25, 30 days. See, I mentioned on the call that our current uh, revenue number is between 47 to 50 crores. So, if I take the 50 crores of receivables what I have in the balance sheet and co- compare it with my current running number, my receivable days is already at one. I is already at 35 days. So, my overall receivables as a percentage of revenue comes down, which further de- decreases my working capital. Okay, and so what we are seeing in, in, in not only uh, you but most companies is that this continues rise in the inventory cost. Uh, the, what that has done is that it has revised the price, the the costing. I mean, uh, the overall value of the inventory, right? Now you have a high level of inventory, and obviously when you when you value it, you know it will be at least twenty five to thirty percent higher than what it was. So is is there an impact of the same on your margin? So no, the as our inventory is calculated cost on an average cost basis. So because of the raw material prices increase, what is happening? Our older inventory, our older inventory value does not increase because we work on an average cost. Our older inventory will lie in the system at the older cost, and the newer inventory will be on the newer cost. And then the system calculates the inventory valuation on an average cost basis. So our inventory valuation, overall inventory value in the book, does not change with the increase of raw material price. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sure, boss. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manish Poddar from Motila Lawswal Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking the call. So, uh, primarily three questions. First one is, uh, would you be able to help me uh, with the channel mix or sales mix that's in the base quarter, four to twenty-one? Uh, so right now this quarter quarter four we had a channel mix of where viewers have contributed about seventy four percent of the business. Gotham, uh, 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 the base quarter four to twenty one. Let's say I have the the this quarter mix is there in the PPT. I'm just looking at the base quarter four to twenty one. Four. Four to twenty one. The base quarter. Uh, I, I so like you understand. like you mentioned seventy four point three percent is in this quarter. I'm just trying to understand the base quarter. March of twenty one, how much was that mix? Oh, at that time, seventy five point three. Yeah, oh, basically, uh, why, why? You are talking about last year ten quarter. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, that in, I think at, at that point of time, it was around seventy one, seventy two percent, seventy two percent. So the mix was very similar. So EV was increased from seventy two to seventy four percent. Okay, seventy five point three last year. Seventy five point three. Okay, so I stand corrected. 
last year. So last year, same quarter, EBO contributed contributed about seventy five percent. Okay. So okay then then the uh, margin mix stands fine. Okay, just then uh, probably two more questions. First one is let's say if you look at your Q1 now the coming quarter, just wanted to understand you know uh, how would you uh, judge the performance because you know last two quarter last you know two years the first quarter has been a whitewash, and Q4 had this giant impact. So you know when you are judging your performance in the next quarter, would it be let's say percentage of what you did in December quarter? Or how how are you internally looking at it, or let's say guiding the team for this quarter? Yeah, see, uh, you, yeah, very rightly you are. So I am. We are going to be looking at on month on month what growth we are going to be doing. So because actually, for us to compare, we we can't compare anything with last year, first quarter, and the year before that because of COVID. Uh, so we would be uh, internally uh, comparing with our uh, previous month number and see how much we are growing month on month based on previous trends. That's the way we would be looking at it, because uh, on mm-hmm. quarter to comp- if I if I have to compare it on a YOY basis, it will be difficult because last year the entire first quarter was affected by uh, lockdowns, and the year before that also was the same. Thing. So j- just any sense, let's say so this quarter Jan Feb March March how how are the numbers stacking up? Would it be let's say twenty forty forty? Is that a rough split? Sorry, Jan Feb March. I didn't understand. This quarter when I'm looking at let's say monthly number. Would Jan Feb March be a split of twenty forty forty? Let's say if you did hundred rupee sales during this quarter. Uh, yeah. Uh, a broad ballpark. Yeah. See broadly, I'll tell you. Right. So in March we did broadly between forty seven to forty eight crores of revenue in March. Okay. And uh, okay. Yeah. So it is. It's uh, yeah. So it's, so it's, I, I got. I, I'm just looking at the end number. So that that is fine. Just one last one, if I can. Uh, just on this warehouse bit. Uh, so you're putting up a warehouse like you mentioned uh, in Bhiwandi in Maharashtra. You know what? What is the capex outlay? And uh, you know, I, I thought earlier the warehouse in South India was enough for your entire expansion plan. So just, you know, wh- why the change in thought? And let's say, what is the capex outlay here? Thanks. Yeah. So Manish, uh, see, it's a very, it's a, it's a decently small warehouse. See, it's not even like a warehouse. Warehouse, it's just like a small mini fulfillment center. And I'll tell you the reason why we are doing it. See, this uh, contributes to a very large portion of our business. And uh, what we've noticed that from Bivandi, even not can be catered very well. So we said, "Ki look, let's try out with a mini warehouse, like a mini fulfillment center, to see if we are able to uh, improve our efficiencies of sale and dispatch for the stores in West and uh, South. So West and North. So uh, the, it's a small warehouse, and the capex what we are looking at will not be very material in nature. From what we understand, it will be about uh, two to three crores, and not more." We are still, we are still not. I, we have, we have identified a location, but still the capex plan is yet to be full and free. But it's not going to be material in nature. Got, got it. Just, just a small feedback. If, if you can incorporate, let's say, the base quarter numbers, let's say for the channel mix, and let's say if you can include the pre-index margins, or uh, let's say on a quarterly basis, or let's say at least on an annual basis, you know, that'll be helpful to understand the performance. So, sure. sure. Thanks so much. Thank you, Manish. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is. From one of Aniruddha Bandari from 16th Street Capital, please go ahead. Yeah, congratulations on good numbers. My question is on cash flows. Uh, so why are the cash flows from operations so low? Uh, EBITDA is 119 crores. Uh, what is causing the difference? See, I think the uh, Aniruddha major reason for our cash flows uh, to be on the lower side is because of the increase in working capital. And largely driven by inventory. So our inventory in uh, March 21 was 80 crores, which has gone up to 165 crores. So one of the reasons for uh, lower cash flows is because of the increase in inventory, which explained uh, earlier that it's because of the supply chain uh, uh, difficulties what we are seeing in the market right now. And what are the reservables pertaining to? I mean, uh, all your EBOs are company on company operated, right? So most of the reservables are. Pertaining to LFS sales of sales yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now is the arrangement. About, sorry, what is the arrangement of uh, you know receivables, and do you also yeah. take the stock back if it doesn't sell for a few months? Say? Sure, I'll explain that. Anil. So Anil, uh, very rightly you pointed out. So uh, the receivables, what you see in the balance sheet, are largely driven by large formats too. So the 60 crores, what number you see in the balance sheet is uh, most of that is LFS. We sell to LFS on a SOR basis, which is a principal-to-principal relationship. So 
accounting uh, according to accounting standards we need to show it as a as debtors in our book now as far as returns are concerned ours is a very core and essential web product so we have actually not seen uh, uh, goods coming back in large quantities from the rece- uh, from the large format shows as returns our returns percentage has been under 1% under 1% okay so under 1% 1% okay sorry and what what uh, investments are we doing to improve this ratio uh, cash flow to ebitda it's very low and, and it's not consistent over last four years as well no see i think look uh, as uh, as the phase increases and the inventory gets normalized the requirement of increase of working capital will not be so high as we have seen in fiscal year 22 so automatically the cash flow from operations will automatically increase. okay perfect thank you thank you the next question is from the line of rahul jain from philip capital please go ahead hello yeah i have a couple of questions uh, my first question is are you facing any pressure on job work charges charges given the increase in cost in tirupur uh yeah hi rahul thanks for the question uh, so rahul we are not seeing any pressure or increase in uh, charges of the job work and the factory charges in tirupur i think it's largely been driven by the material cost of fabric uh, but uh, as far as subcontracting and the factory charges and job working charges are concerned it has stayed pretty consistent we don't see any fluctuation okay and my second question is uh, uh, regarding the absolute uh, anp spent uh, the cost has declined 20% uh, to 5 crores again 6.4 crores in fy21 what is the guidance going forward for anp spent See, usually, uh, Anurag, we will be uh, this year has been low because this year was a COVID impacted year, so we were very uh, frugal in our advertising spend. To be honest with you, in a normalized year, we would be uh, around two to three percent. Uh, on a on a long term average, we would be two three percent. There would be some years, some years where we might touch four percent, but on a general uh, normalized basis, we would be at around two to three percent of revenue. Okay. and could you share the total ebo area and average area for us to possible yeah so our average area is anirudh around 400 about 390 to 400 square feet average area of our store okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of rehas mehta from green edge wealth please go ahead yeah uh, hi thanks for the opportunity vesha this side uh, so i have two questions uh, one if you could uh, you know talk about uh, you know in terms of the future revenue growth how much of that uh, will come from volume growth and uh, how much from product mix or premiumization and also if you could talk about uh, you know you alluded to value added product so how do you define value added products what is their average selling price sure So see, uh, I'll take the second question first, and then I'll come to the other one. Uh, see, from a value-added product perspective, what do we? How do we define value-added product? See, uh, leggings and chudidars are of your four uh, generic bottom. Uh, value-added products are anything like pants, jeggings, uh, harems, patiyalas, palazos, leggings. They come under the value-added mix. Now, uh, the value-added products for us contribute to almost half of our business. earlier leggings and chudidars used to dominate it but now uh, the value added products are contributing to almost half of the business uh, the average selling price of the value added products would be around 800 to 900 rupees a unit see what we are doing as far as pricing our products are concerned we want to try and price a product as low as uh, less than 1049 so for us uh, 83% of our entire product portfolio won't be listed more less than 1000 rupees because consciously we want to uh price our product right with very high quality so our average selling price for a value added product would be 800 to 900 uh, rupees per unit uh, as far as um, future growth is concerned uh, see we are as a company uh, looking to grow uh, at a cadre of more than 20% over a long period of time because our category is very huge and uh, maybe in the coming years our growth would be higher it would be slightly higher, around 30 or higher 30 30 or more than 30% but on a long term basis we are looking to grow at a cadre of around 20% as far as revenues are concerned 
Got it. And how much of this would be from uh, be volume growth driven versus uh, product mix or premiumization change? So, uh, see, uh, for example, or if suppose I'm I'm looking at a growth of thirty percent in the in the immediate couple of years window, uh, probably uh, fifteen to twenty percent should be one. Got it. Got it. And just to follow up on this, right? So, uh, uh, so how much would at leisure be, uh, you know, a part of your overall uh, revenue mix? And also in, you know, uh, jeggings, track pants, etc. Uh, what would be our right to win, you know, versus let's say somebody like Page or Enamor, you know, who are operating at uh, broadly similar price points? Yeah, see, for us, uh, Athleisure right now is a very, very small contributor. See, for example, all these newer products what we have launched in Loungewear and Athleisure, we are just in the first year. It takes a, it takes a few quarters, it takes a couple of years for a category or a product to settle down. So if you see right now as a contributor to sales, it will be a very, very small percentage. But uh, one of our, uh, one of the reasons why a customer is coming back to more color store, the range of colors and or and the range of products what they find under one booth, right? So today when a customer is coming to a go color, she's finding the athleisure bottom, she's finding the western wear bottom, she's finding she's finding the fusion wear bottom or ethnic wear bottom under one roof. That is our value added proposition. Our value added proposition is basically getting all the products, all the colors of bottom wear under one roof. That is where we have that uh, selling edge. Arisha, sorry to interrupt you. I'll request you to come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. A request to all the participants, please restrict to one question per participant. If time permit, please come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. Requesting participants to restrict to one question per participant. The next question is from the line of Manas Visha from ICICI Prudential. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. Uh, just two questions pertaining to inventory. One is, what is the aging of your uh, finished goods? Uh, if you can answer that. And second, uh, what would be the uh, quantum because of revaluation uh, this time, you know, because raw mat cost and NRV has gone up, right? If you can just explain both of these. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, our finished goods, most of our finished goods are under uh, one year. See, we have a provisioning policy also, Manasi. So, inventory which is greater than 365 days old, uh, we do pro we provide for it. And this year also, we have, as per the policy, provided for inventory in our book, uh, which is not, which is a very relatively smaller number. So, the, if I take the inventory aging of our finished goods and raw materials, it's well within one year. Uh, and uh, this provisioning is less than a percent? I'm sorry? The provisioning is less than a percent? It's, okay. Yeah, it's, no, it will be around a percent. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not having the exact percentage handy, but it will be around a percent. Okay. And on the second question? On the second question, see, like I told, explained, our inventory valuation does not change with the increase of raw material pricing because in the books, uh, the cost of inventory uh, will be always based on when it was purchased. So the system throws out a weighted average cost of inventory. So the newer inventory will be at the newer raw material pricing uh, and the older inventory will be at the older. So because of the raw materials uh, increase uh, in price, the inventory valuation does not dramatically change. No, but it could uh, change because of the NRV increase, right? Uh, the materialization. I mean, it's cost of uh, realization, whichever is okay. So okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, blended does not change much. Yeah, exactly. No, the uh, I'll just interrupt here. It is cost uh -huh. or uh, uh, realizable value, which is lower, not higher. Correct. Correct. Lower. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Sure. And uh, secondly, uh, you know, even if I uh, exclude advertising expenses, your other costs have actually, you know. Fallen or are flat on a YOI basis. What is the key contributor to this? Which costs? Uh, uh, your other expenses. Your other expenses. Ex of employee. See, uh, it's hard to compare with last year because last year was a COVID related year and this year also has been a COVID impacted year. So we've kept costs low. Even like if I take the advertising costs, like I was mentioning, we kept it very low as, as low as 1.2%. So from a bottom line perspective, we have kept costs low because this has been a COVID impacted year. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gautam Rati 
from CWC Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Gautam. Uh, thanks for taking my question. So, Gautam, uh, I just wanted to understand one thing. So, uh, you, you uh, in the earlier part of the call, you alluded that you, you have a run rate of about 47 to 50 crore per month of revenue, right? So, if I yeah. just do a back of the envelope calculation, it says that we should have somewhere around, we, we might have lost somewhere around 20, 25 crore of revenue maybe in Jan due to Omicron. So, is this understanding right? And if if, if, if it is, so, how should we think about then the, the, the gross margins at a normalized base, right? Because this base would not be the right to think about. So, can you just help us understand this? Yeah, yeah sure, Gautam. So, see, uh, yeah, you can you can assume that we've lost out 2025 crores because of January Omicron reviews. I mean, uh, that's not a, that's a right thing to assume. But from a GM perspective, uh, see, like I told you, more than 97% of our sales happen on full price, irrespective of the channel, right? So, for us, our GM does not uh, really uh, get impacted uh, our sales. Our GM pretty much stays consistent. This, so, Gautam, just wanted to understand, is it right to say that you, so your GM last quarter was 66, this quarter is 68. What is the right level of GM that we should be working with? Um, uh, what yeah, is uh, last, year, last year, same quarter, we had a GM of 51%. And this quarter we had a GM of 61%. So I think the GM number would you can assume would be 60, 60 to 61% would be the right number to assume on a long term basis. This is after taking into account subcontracting cost also. Yes, it's yes. Okay, okay. Okay. So so 68% is slight bit of an aberration, right? No, so 68, so 68 minus uh, the subcontracting cost of five, uh, seven, right? Okay. So 61%. 61% is the right number to assume after subcontracting charge. After subcontracting cost for the full year? Yes, absolutely. So okay. for the full year, the GM was 60%. For the quarter four, it was 61%. Perfect. And just one last question, uh, if I may just, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to understand this 50 odd stores that we have opened. Is it fair to assume that by, by, by next year onwards, they should start clocking a run rate of anywhere between 80 to 80 lakh to 1 crore on your, which is your normal expectation from a store? Is that, is that a fair ask? Well, uh, difficult to assume like that, but uh, from our past experience, we have seen that any store what we open kind of reaches some sort of maturity within 12 to 15 or 12 to 18 months. So we would be hopeful the stores that we opened this year Maybe by the end of next year, once it crosses 12 months or 15 months, it should reach some sort of maturity. Thank you. The next question is from one of Deepak Poddar from Sapphire Capital Partners. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, sir, for the opportunity. So, sir, so, I just wanted to understand in terms of EBITDA margin. Uh, so, so uh, uh, what's the what's the range that we might be looking at uh, given the raw material uh, inflation that we have seen over, over the near to medium term in terms of margin? See, uh, in terms of, uh, so let me talk about three in days EBITDA because that would give a better kind of uh, idea. See, we would, uh, on a steady state basis, look at about 20 to 21% of pre in days EBITDA as far as annualized risk is concerned. As the, as the business uh, keeps increasing, that there will be little upside in EBITDA because of uh, better efficiencies of fixed costs. But 21, 22 to 21% of pre in days EBITDA is what we are looking at. And if you take post in days, it would be about, uh, if I'm not wrong, it will vary about on an annualized basis between 35 and 37. Uh, no, uh, 25 to 27%. No, no. no. Uh, on post in days basis, it will be between 35 and 37%. And pre in days basis, it will range between 20 and 22%. Three in days. Okay. And, and the current quarter, our margins was around 33%. So that was uh, that was largely because of uh, lower revenue base and, uh, and, and uh, that's the major reason. No, one of the one of the major reasons is COVID. See, because uh, COVID is definitely there was a COVID impact in quarter four, there was a COVID impact in quarter one and quarter two. So the EBITDA obviously has been a little lower side uh, because of the COVID impact. Yeah, yeah. So so that impacted your revenue, right? So, yes, absolutely. Okay. Now that's it from my side. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chirag from Value Quest Investment Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, sir, my first question was reason for higher other income in FY22 and how we should look this number going ahead. Uh, see, the uh, reason for higher other income in uh, FY22 uh, is also because of the larger cash balance what we have. 
so we have had it uh, in uh, fixed deposits and uh, mutual funds so the reasons of higher uh, other income is uh, because of higher cash value sir but if i see last two quarters it is run rate is about 3 3 odd crore whereas full year is around 21 crore so i'm sure in q1 or q2 there is some exceptional other income which would have led to this 21 crore other income but for full year no no that because of india's chirap uh, because in india's uh, waivers are also shown in other income so because of waivers what we get from la- so that's more of a india's entry okay so going ahead is it fair to assume the 3 4 crore run rate would continue right so it will get uh, normalized yeah i yeah the, it will be fair to assume that correct right in second was on inventory so is it fair to assume again h1 fy23 will go back to this 9500 days run rate which is currently 150 plus so currently uh, currently our average sale monthly sale what we are doing here is about 41 uh, is around 47 to 50 so 47 to 50 crores so based right. on our current run rate we are already at about uh, 93 to 94 days of inventory but on a reported basis you know in past you used to be at say 995 days currently on a reported basis it is at say 150 plus so maybe say 6 months down the line when things get normalized yeah, is it fair to on assume a, yeah on a 6 month basis we should be able to come back to that number yeah. right and just lastly uh, gross margin guidance which you gave 60 61% is after considering the cotton inflation which we are seeing and the price increase we have taken we don't see any any impact on gross margins right uh no the 60 61% should continue we have already factored in that thank you next question is from line of Vin- vinod from union mutual fund please go ahead yeah uh, thank you for taking my question i just had one bookkeeping question can you just uh, tell us uh, what was the rent you paid for a for full year of fy22 uh uh bonsor can you uh, I think it's around 57 crore. Let I last Mr. Mohan to confirm. 57, 57 crores. 57 crores of rent you pay. Okay, 57.25 crores of revenue. Sorry, and and uh, 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 how much was it like? How much of it was on a variable basis, and how much was fixed? It will be largely. Uh, it will be more, more than 90 percent of it would be fixed. Variable would be a very small component. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all from us. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Benoit Jariwala from Sunidhi Securities and Finance. Please go ahead. Yes, I got them. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to know what is the India's impact on PBT for FY20 and FY22? Uh, see the, the the PBT impact would be not very different. It would be little different. I mean, I would. Uh, See, yeah, like for example, on a if I take fiscal year 20, as far as I remember, the difference uh, between uh, PAT on a India's and non-India's basis was only three four crores. So the delta difference between non-India's PAT and India's PAT is not too much. And the three four crores means the non-India's PAT was higher and the India's PAT was lower, no, right? No, no, the India, no, the India, the non-India's PAT was higher. You're right. India's PAT was lower. The reported number was lower. This is in FI twenty, and what about FI twenty two? FI twenty two also, uh, Mr. Mohan, how much would be the delta? Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, I stand. Uh, you have to stand corrected, Gautam. For twenty FI twenty, it was around eight crores. Was the effect of uh, eight crores? Days for, yeah, one one six particularly the one one five another. No, one one six uh, India's. Yeah, one one six. So FI twenty yeah. was eight crores, is it at the patch level? Okay, and what about FI twenty two? Participants, please stay connected while we reach on Mr. Mohan back, uh, Mohan back to the call. Participants, please stay connected while we reach on Mr. Mohan. I think we dropped out. Ah, uh, so I'm trying to reconnect him. Participants, please stay connected. Uh, 
All right, we have the line for Mr. Mohan connected. Uh, sorry, I got disconnected in between. I didn't know that. Uh, I was trying to see. Uh, 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 Mr. Mohan is asking, uh, what is the uh, what is the impact on PAC in fiscal year 22 and 20 because of India? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try to. I, I, I'll explain. In fiscal year 20, the impact of India is 116 is around 8 crores. And uh, okay. this is now presently around 7 crores. This goes because this is, uh, this impact of uh, uh, PBT on India's on PBT will be always there because we are uh, signing up new uh, uh, properties and uh, renewing the old one. So there will be a renewal of the old one so and the closure of the uh, engagement of new one. So the impact will be around 7 to 8 crores on a continuous basis. Understood. PBT. And and this is the impact, the 8 and 7 crores respectively that you've spoken uh, of, is the PAT impact, right? Yeah, it'll be the PAT. Uh, yeah, PAT and PBT both. I don't know. Uh, there won't be any difference on that. Yeah, it'll be okay. the PAT impact. Yeah. Okay. And likewise... So, uh, so the reported number would be, uh, the reported number would be 7 crores lower or 8 crores lower. Understood. Understood. Fair enough. Thanks so much. Uh, second and last question is what percentage of our contract manufacturing is where uh, you buy the, pro uh, uh, you provide the raw material to the contract manufacturer? Uh, largely. So uh, for us, majority of our sourcing happens through that model where we buy fabric and then we give it to the subcontractor uh, to convert it. So uh, hard to give a percentage right now because that will vary from quarter to quarter, but majority comes from that model. Is it possible to give an on an annualized basis where you look to maintain this percentage in a particular range or something like that? Uh, I, I sorry, I'm, I'm not having that number handy, but uh, I'm uh, from what I understand, it will more than seventy percent of our entire sourcing happens through where we buy the fabric directly and give it to the subcontractor for conversion. Understood. That's it for my side. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Ankit Babil from Subcom Ventures. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, could you please let us know the seasonality of your company on a quarterly basis? Like Q1 pertains to what percentage of your total yearly revenue and what other quarters, uh, you know, but I mean, uh, contributes. And my second question is, uh, sustainable working capital days going ahead, assuming normal uh, environment, uh, with a breakup in inventory days, receivable days, and payable days. Yeah, sure. Uh, see, from a seasonality or sale, a sales perspective is concerned, our, uh, we see very little seasonality from a sales perspective because quarter three, of course, being the highest, uh, quarter three usually contributes to about 33 to 34% of the business. Uh, and the balance quarter one, quarter two, and quarter four are pretty much almost the same. Quarter four is being the lowest. Quarter one, quarter two are similar. So quarter three would be about 34%. And quarter four, uh, quarter three, sorry, quarter three would be about 34%. And quarter four would be about 18 to 19% as a contribution. And quarter one and quarter two would be similar. And on the second question, uh, uh, so, sorry, what was the second? The second question was on working capital. Sustainable working capital and a breakup between inventory receivables and payable days. Sure, sure. So on a sustainable basis, we look at a working capital days from anywhere between 120 to 130 days. So inventory would be 90 to 95 days and uh, receivables would be about 30 to 35 days. Receivables would be 30 to 35. Correct. And in and uh, payables? Inventory, uh, no, inventory payables. would be 90 to 95 days. Tables would be about 10 to 11. 10 to 11, that's it. Okay. Yeah. That's it, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Parishat Shah from Bureau Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my first question was on the gross margin. I think, bottom in one of the earlier questions, you responded, you expect margins to be around 60 61%. I just wanted to clarify, this is on a steady state, uh, right? I and mean, I'm guessing that as EO improves, the 60-61 can actually head higher. And uh, second question was on uh, EBITDA margin. I think you said uh, you're targeting 20-22% uh, to 22 free India. Just wanted to know what the free India margins were for, for Q4 and fiscal 22, if you can help with that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So see, uh, so yes, 60-61% uh, to 61 are the current gross margin. So as the 
uh, uh, the channel mix changes and gets more skewed towards TVO and online, we see this gross margin is definitely improving beyond 60-61. But on the current channel mix, we are uh, estimating that 60-61% should continue. As EBO sales increases, this gross margin will further improve. Uh, difficult to quantify how much will it improve, but it will definitely improve. Uh, as far as uh, EBITDA is concerned, uh, we are having an EBITDA of about uh, are 21 to about 20 to 21 percent on a normalized basis. Without the impact of COVID, we are having about 20 to 21 percent of EBITDA for the year. Uh, for quarter four, if I take the pre in days EBITDA, we were at about 18.9 percent. Understood. So, this was basically the impact of the January uh, wave. Uh, yeah. of yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, that will be the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope we've been able to answer all your queries. We look forward to such interactions in the future. We hope to live up to the expectations of, of you all in the future. In case you require any further details, you may contact Mr. Devane from SGA, our investor relations partner. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much. On behalf of Damp Capital Advisors Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.